This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. One of the most fun but inaccurate tropes in science fiction is the crowded, harrowing asteroid belt, navigated by an ace pilot on a quick interplanetary jaunt. But once humanity fills vast open stretches of space with artificial habitats, that trope might actually turn out accurate. So today we are back to the Megastructural series here on Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I am your aforementioned host, Isaac Arthur. Normally in this series we talk about this or that giant artificial structure humanity might create, but today we'll be looking at them from a different perspective, how folks might navigate between them and how that might impact both the creation of these structures and the civilizations living on and near them. However, there are many different types of structures to discuss many of which lend different approaches to travel, and while we'll briefly explain each one, in the interest of brevity I'll also reference other videos that detail these concepts in greater depth. Nonetheless, this will be a long discussion so now is a great time to grab a drink and a snack, and if you enjoy the content, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons while you're at it. So what's the big deal about navigating between megastructures? You're in space after all so it would seem like the obvious mode of transportation would be spaceships. But it's not quite that simple, especially when you're building truly mega structures and building a lot of them. We'll start by defining what we mean by a mega structure. The term basically means anything really big that we build, but in this episode we're focusing on the ones we build in space. That can include habitats we would build to live on or farm in, like rotating O'Neill cylinders who use centrifugal force to emulate gravity or birch shell planets built around a star or a supermassive black hole, or even planets built in the shapes of discs, sombreros, or donuts that we discussed in some of our more theoretical episodes. There are also non-habitat megastructures built to disassemble planets or stars for raw materials, accelerate spaceships to enormous speeds, or to move entire stellar systems themselves. Not to mention computation, artificial intelligence, or simulated intelligence focused ones, like the Matryoshka Brain where transportation might simply be by radio waves or communication lasers. Travel between these objects is going to vary a lot from size to size and purpose to purpose, not to mention available technology. Normally on this show we try to stay firmly inside known physics, but we also don't like to bypass theoretical options and things like artificial gravity, anti-gravity, and wormholes all have a big impact on our discussion if they are available technologies. Artificial gravity, meaning gravity not created naturally by mass or emulated with centrifugal force, something like the gravity plating we often see in science fiction starships and space stations, lets you get by without rotating things, which is a problem for coupling objects together. Anti-gravity lets you get around the issue of them needing to orbit very fast around planets or stars, in favor of just hanging in place effectively stationary to whatever they are orbiting or each other. Wormholes, if you can make them small and basically portals like we see in sci-fi, not only makes transit between two megastructures easy, but opens up whole new types of megastructures. We have some tricks that will let us mimic in whole or part some of these effects that we will discuss today too. Another big factor in navigating around is density of people and structures. For much the same reason you do not build a freeway between your house and your neighbors, or a sidewalk to run freight between two metropolises, or passengers for that matter too. If we were talking about a planet with just a pair of space stations, one in low orbit and one in high, with maybe a few thousand people on each, then a little shuttle probably is sufficient. Alternatively, we need to keep in mind that something like a Eucumonopolis, a planet-wide city of a few trillion people, which might be portrayed in science fiction as a great galactic empire capital having a few dozen shuttles flying around the sky at any moment, in reality probably needs to move a billion people and a billion tons of cargo back and forth from orbit on any given day so that at any given moment there might be a million ships flying around there. So too, some of our megastructures are designed for millions of people to live in, others billions or even trillions, and some of the truly monstrous ones like the Birch Planet might have trillions of trillions of people calling them home. These ironically might have low traffic simply because while they have Earth-like gravity on their surfaces, they are so enormous that their escape velocity is a decent fraction of light speed, and off-world travel might be very rare except by something like digital transmission, a kind of teleportation where we just move a digital copy of someone's mind to an android or cloned body instead of moving them. Not that you need to travel much off a birch planet, even the smallest of them has more living area than an entire galaxy's worth of planets, while most versions would have more living room than we expect to find on every single planet in the observable universe. 
so you don't have much need for off-world tourism. Of course we might not need much travel between more mundane megastructures either, after all, remote work and remote tourism were the more classic options like the internet or virtual reality, or the mind digitizing and transfer method may be quite common things in the future to the exclusion of transport. Indeed many systems might frown on non-vital physical transport simply for all the navigation and debris issues involved, which we'll also get to today. One type of megastructure is what we call a Dyson Sphere or usually a Dyson Swarm, which is less an individual structure than a vast cloud of many of them englobing a star to make use of all its light. We also have a smaller and denser version of this called a Planet Swarm, which is essentially when you fill all the orbital space up around a planet with various megastructures. Scale in astronomy is always so hard to convey, but your typical O'Neill cylinder habitat is bigger than a large metropolis or mountain. They are enormous and on the small side of what we consider a megastructure. It would take about a million of them to equal the living area and solar cross-section of Earth, and we need a couple billion Earth's worth of living area to absorb all the sun's light and use it for artificial land and ecosystems, so you'd be talking about sticking over a million billion of them, a quadrillion, in orbit around our sun. A planet swarm is far more modest, relatively speaking, in that it might only be a few billion such stations orbiting that planet, but again denser as they are packed into an area maybe a million kilometers around Earth, rather than a volume around a million times larger than that around a sun. Sounds cluttered in either case, and on the one hand it is and on the other it is not. Megastructures are hardly limited to habitation cylinders and we never expect a Dyson Swarm to be composed of nothing but O'Neill cylinders and evenly spaced at that, but if they were, we'd expect each to be the sole occupant of a volume of space a couple thousand kilometers wide while themselves only being a couple dozen kilometers across. That's no denser than a continent with two or three cities or mountains on it, and empty space between, and only considers it in two dimensions rather than volume. Planet swarms are denser affairs, but would still tend to have an average density, especially in higher orbits, of hundreds of kilometers between such titanic space habitats. When it comes to traffic between them though, we should still not picture one lone shuttle going between two O'Neill cylinders. At these sorts of distances you could build cheap and simple spaceships no bigger than a personal automobile, and no more high tech, that could flit across the distance between the two much faster than a car could and on a great deal less fuel, as there is no air or road trying to slow you down, just vacuum. Such being the case you would expect a lot of back and forth travel, such a cylinder habitat can house around a million people, and if we assume most folks need to fly to their neighboring habitat on average once a week then you'd have a personal shuttle launching between them about once a second, and in a big long chain of spaceships between them much akin to a stretch of freeway between two cities. In something like a planet swarm, and if folks drove around as often as we tend to, you might see several trillion spaceships flying around that planet's orbital volume at any given moment. Needless to say, this is quite the traffic nightmare, and you might have all sorts of local or system-wide laws, treaties and regulations, and discouraging fees or taxes to minimize personal vehicle usage just to limit this congestion and high-speed collision and debris concerns. Though again all things being relative, those ships might tend to move in columns through space, but evenly distributed would still have many kilometers between them. They also don't have to be moving very fast relative to everything around them, Two space stations on the same orbital path are effectively stationary relative to each other, and if a thousand kilometers apart, you wouldn't expect to ever see folks going between them at much faster than airplane speeds. Potentially that saves a lot of fuel and twice over since you don't need to push as much mass around at slower speeds since you don't have to have thick armor on your ship to avoid being killed by all the random space debris floating around. You will need armor on your ships because space is very empty and things moving between it need to move very fast and at those kind of speeds even something very small can ruin your whole day if it hits you. And just because two stations on the same orbital path are relatively stationary, and the ships between them wouldn't likely move very fast, does not mean any of the debris from the other orbital paths, or ships crossing lanes so to speak, would not be going at normal orbital speeds. So even if the ships are just intended for short jaunts between neighboring halves, They either still need thick armor or the system needs very good debris clearance, or both. We detailed more issues with debris in our Megastructural Maintenance and Space Janitors episode, and realistically you need a decent amount of heavy armor even with good clearance, and armor is proportionally heavier for smaller vessels because of the square cube law. 
If ships need 10 centimeters of steel plating to protect against the sorts of debris that commonly escape routine debris clearance methods, then it needs 10 centimeters over all its surface, whether it's the size of a car or a bus, or a basketball in a city for that matter. Some basketball sized sensor, maintenance, or delivery drone needs that same armor. Maybe less of a safety margin as it's more expendable, but its cargo capacity generally rises with the cube of its width, whereas its armor needs will rise with the square of width. So some bulky mega freighter just isn't using much of its mass for armor, even if it has thicker armor than a personal space yacht. The thing is, armor doesn't need to move, which is why space stations can get away with having so much more mass and protective hull. For the stations that are not moving relative to each other, we can get away with physical connections like tunnels and tethers, or tethers with an armored tunnel around them. And while a vacuum tunnel is a handy transport method since there is no air drag, you do have the option of pressurizing them for folks to walk through. Except they can't walk because there is no gravity, so they float. Except such a tunnel can be a long cylinder, and thus be spun like any other cylinder habitat. So long as it's wide enough not to cause big differences in gravity from your feet to your head or a vertigo feeling. Bigger habitats in the same orbital path might opt to connect via vacuum trains on tethers inside an armored shell, or they might connect with something like a 10 meter radius long spinning cylindrical tunnel complete with gardens and boulevards and bike paths, or both or combinations of both, a wide cylinder but with a train along the central axis tether. This is a key notion for space habitats though, because as long as the tethers are reasonably sturdy, you can use them to lash habitats together not only on the same orbital path but off the side a bit too, creating conglomerations. Generally, you could lash two small stations a hundred meters apart with nothing more sturdy than some yarn, and two very large space stations together separated by a couple kilometers with nothing more advanced than the sorts of cables we use in a suspension bridge let alone the super strong tensile materials like graphene we often envision building these habitats out of. They're also mobile, so you could be detaching them or lengthening or contracting them with winches if things weren't quite stationary or you wanted to move the stations. These also become great for moving people and cargo down at essentially no fuel expenditure, and also as high bandwidth communication or power lines. Or other utilities too. As I've mentioned, the O'Neill Cylinder is on the small side of megastructures, and we'll get to the bigger ones in a bit, but it is still huge and not only will they tend to outnumber all the bigger megastructures by quite a lot, but they're also likely to be vastly outnumbered by smaller structures. These could be smaller human habitat drums just a couple dozen meters in radius and length or support facilities like factories, spaceship docks and dockyards, low gravity low armor space farms or big huge but light solar panels, or great big armored mirrors for bouncy and concentrating light to smaller solar collectors while providing extra collision barriers to the space habitat and its ancillary stations. Either way you might be transmitting more than power between such small facilities, like water or air recycling. A smaller station having its own supply tanks for backup, probably, but relying on more centralized or specialized places for production, recycling, and primary storage. On the notion of armoring a solar panel or mirror, a solar panel in space can be very light and thin, and a mirror more so, and thus is quite vulnerable to damage as well as being pushed around by sunlight and solar wind, or eddies of spaceship exhaust, so you might opt to cover them in armor as ballast and shield, and wrap your space station and all of its ancillary stations. That lets you use smaller craft internally with little need for protection as the whole conglomeration. This is a key notion though, conglomerations. In something like a Dyson Swarm or Planet Swarm, you do need your overall density of structures to be low, but they hardly need to be spread out at the local level. You probably would see conglomerations of habitats well into the billions of people all lashed together, sharing ancillary facilities also lashed together, and inside some big protective framework of collision armor and point defense systems, which helps minimize incoming debris issues and also outgoing junk. See the Life on Board and O'Neill Cylinder episode for more discussion of this notion of tethers and connected structures. What about more isolated megastructures? or much bigger ones, ones with their own gravity or where the atmosphere isn't kept inside a can that ships dock externally with, and how about moving around inside them? As we saw in our episode Continent-Sized Rotating Habitats, cylinder and ring habs can potentially be made very large, essentially wards unto themselves or bigger. For them, someone coming in might dock externally on the rotating section, or some non-rotating protective superstructure or they might come down the rotating axis to a hub port in the center of the cylinder cap, 
assuming it has one, stations might opt to have curved ends, internally those places would curve up to the axis and have low gravity as you rose up to them, and it is arguably structurally better to have a curved end to your cylinder than a flat cap. But the bigger ones do not need this cap to go all the way to the central rotational axis, Things like the McKendry Cylinder, essentially an O'Neill Cylinder but a hundred times wider and longer, only need a rim wall to keep the air in and much like our own atmosphere it thins out to near nothing eventually, so above that height no rim wall is needed and you just fly right in. That's handy for slowing down, which costs fuel in the vacuum of space, just as much speeding up and indeed more since you need more fuel to speed up initially, since you also need to accelerate your slow down fuel, meaning you need more than double the fuel, often far more than double. A ship that can slow down by plowing into air in an open air megastructure is much more economically efficient. So too, the rocket equation that makes that the case only applies to rockets and ships carrying all their fuel, and such megastructures will often be quite capable of holding a spaceship away at high speeds, saving them all or at least a good fraction of their fuel. On such stations you might have ships landing on the rotating sections and departing by them to save some launch and stop fuel quite a lot on these larger ones too as a McKendry Cylinder might be spinning a few kilometers per second, or 10,000 kilometers per hour, a decent speed to be traveling inside a solar system where habitats are only thousands of kilometers apart, not millions like planets. The bigger ones like Banks Orbitals and Niven Ring Worlds would hurl you off at about 100 or 1,000 kilometers per second respectively. You can dock, very carefully, using this same trick to save fuel, assuming the outside is a rotating cylinder and on these bigger ones they might be. However, you can also run a big mass driver right down the central axis of these bigger habitats. A thousand kilometer long railgun gives quite a shove to a spaceship, you could exit at standard orbital speeds around 10 kilometers per second from one. Plus, it's just a long shaft so there's no reason you can't make it even longer by extending out past the end caps or rim walls of the hab. Indeed if you were docking ships at the central axis of a cylinder or ring hab rather than on the outside rotating part, you might tend to do a long extended access out to space docks just to keep them fairly clear of your habitat and give you extra length to shoot spaceships out via mass driver. As a side note, we tend to see ships docked in open space in science fiction, except in a dry dock meant to be pressurized, but that exposed them to all sorts of radiation and debris. And while they are designed for that while traveling, it is quite likely a space dock would tend to have a protective shell around its docked ships, even if it was not pressurized, as that at least protects drones or maintenance crews working on the outside from debris or needing bulkier armor or spacesuits. It also helps with docking and berthing, which can be time consuming while you wait for all your connections and pressure tests and matching all the more so if you have to use big sturdy docking collars and ports designed to handle constant erosion from space dust and radiation, or the need for spacesuits to be on during docking and berthing in case of rupture or leak. There's also a big difference between a spacesuit that just keeps air in, and which you don't mind if it leaks because you can recapture that air leaking into your enclosure, and a suit meant for outside use and radiation debris issues. This might be a hard shell structure always in place or something that folded out to cover ships, or even inflated around them, and again might not need to be airtight unless you want it pressurized. Often you wouldn't since spaceships mostly wouldn't be designed for operating in atmospheres too, so it might have been built without air and corrosion or pressure issues in mind. They could dock at some relatively remote space dock, in terms of both distance and personnel on board, then take a train into the habitat down that long axis shaft, which might also be a mass driver or other style of space catapult. You can also slow ships with mass drivers too, like a runway for an aircraft, but that's a very tricky and precise thing to do. Of course piloting spacecraft generally is, and when it comes to coming and going around megastructures in space, the odds are the human pilot ain't piloting jack. The onboard computer is and probably has a required override switch for traffic control to activate. Accident and terrorism are also big worries with spaceships, so I would not be too surprised if all the ships had to have an active transmitter that includes a direct line override that was constantly being tested to make sure it worked by traffic control, and if it didn't, automated defense cans started tracking that ship. If you're operating a private or commercial spaceship, you're essentially flying a nuclear bomb with all that kinetic energy, so they're going to want assurances that you're not going to strike them by distraction, neglect, accident, or malice, and they probably want more than your word of honor that won't happen. This is even more extreme for interstellar spaceships which might be moving at a high fraction of light speed, 
where a single truck-sized vehicle represents a major threat to an entire planetary civilization, let alone a megastructure, though we should never assume megastructures are particularly fragile, and indeed the folks living inside them are arguably better shielded than planet-bound folks, since all that protective rock is under you on a planet, whereas on a megastructure it will generally be between you and whatever is colliding. You live inside the land, not on top of it. We could probably adapt a lot of our current aircraft and maritime control to this, including the difficulty of matching different rules between different nations and polities, but that is one key difference. Spaceships are weapons of mass destruction and will be known to be that from day one, unlike aircraft in the early days of the 20th century, let alone the first person to ever hollow out a canoe. They are also very fast, which is not only why they are so destructive but a big issue for control, as you might have to make near instant decisions. For this reason you might tend to have large no-go zones around megastructures where only autopilots or even tugboat approaches were used. Tugboats might be drones designed to attach to hard points on a ship hull, though we also have options for some things like laser propulsion being used as something like a Star Trek tractor beam. But a very good deal of traffic might not be from self-propelled ships in favor of tether connections to space docks some way off from the main structure or via mass driver launch. Now this mass driver approach to launching is likely to be even more the case on natural gravity habitats, the ones that actually produce gravity by sheer mass rather than spin, be they a classic sphere or something more exotic like a donut shaped hoop board or flat earth. These don't have no gravity areas any more than earth does, so you can orbit them and you do have to pay all that energy to launch. However, unlike our planets they are artificial and often work using a ton of active support technology, like the Atlas Pillars or Orbital Rings we've discussed building them out of in those episodes. Such being the case it would be very easy to make mass drivers under the surfaces during construction, and which protruded out above their atmosphere via space towers using the same core technologies you built the thing out of. You would also probably tend to incorporate those as your routine onward long distance transport systems too, same as we often discuss using vacuum trains or hyperloops for cheap high speed transit on Earth, and since you're building them in from the outset it makes it easier to do too. Plus you only build these sorts of megastructures if you have really mastered the core technologies needed for such devices anyway, as they all operate on the same basic principle of accelerating mass magnetically down long vacuum shafts. You would probably see some sort of vacuum trains on any megastructure too, or even larger spaceships, It's probably nice to go for a long walk or car drive or flight through your garden landscape in such a thing, but time is money as they say, and moreover, you don't care if your commercial freight vehicles and drones are getting to enjoy the scenic landscape and would not want the extra delay and cost of them doing so. It is neat to think of sailing down the World River of Atapopolis, a super long skinny rotating habitat that might be tens of kilometers wide, but millions or billions long. See the continent-sized routine space habitat episode for details, but neat as that is, you still stick access ports for ships on the outside and vacuum trains in the hull, for when speed matters. Interestingly, that means many folks might tend to have their equivalent of a garage, driveway, or front door in their basement on such structures, as traffic might tend to mostly arrive via underground shafts. Of course as we discussed in life on board an O'Neill Cylinder, same as smaller stations and conglomerations could detach and move to another one if they liked, the hulls of many rotating habitats might be designed to have house ships come dock and rise up into the internal landscape in some high-tech far future version of mobile homes or houseboats, you just rent, lease, or buy a plot of land with a house hub dock in it, and move there and move on when you want. I don't think most folks would opt to commute that way, but then we don't know that many folks would commute to work in the future, in favor of either remote work or simply because we might not tend to have classic employment in a post-scarcity future where robots do nearly everything. Which is another point, most traffic in, around, and between megastructures is probably robots, and a lot of the remainder is probably robot piloted passenger vehicles. I mentioned the Topopolis a moment ago though, and earlier that you could connect two megastructures together with a long skinny rotating habitat corridor, and two really big structures, or a long chain of them, might just use a Topopolis as a connection method. However, if we are talking very big megastructures, potentially self-gravitating ones, could we connect them with land bridges, or at least pressurized tunnels? Could we connect two planets together so you could walk between them, and without any clock tech like artificial or anti-gravity? As is so often the case, the answer is yes, if you have a nearly limitless supply of money and manpower and really want to, 
and civilizations that build artificial worlds generally meet these qualifications. There's nothing stopping you from building a Topopolis all the way through an orbital path as a big long circle, and you could have all sorts of cylinder habitats hanging out the sides of it connected to its non-rotating protective sheath, or have two such rings with habitats in between them like rungs on a ladder, what we call a rung world. Though the junction on these is a bit tricky, especially if you want to maintain the sensation of gravity as you transfer, you are not limited to circles, so you could also do an ellipse like Earth's orbit around the Sun is. Such being the case, there is nothing stopping you from building one right over or under the Earth's poles and held from dropping by a massive space tower protruding several thousand kilometers up, then you just build a big spiral ramp up that. Gravity would begin to drop off from Earth, unless you are really good with making micro black holes or containing ultra dense materials like neutronium and suspend them along the path to compensate for lower gravity as you ascend. You then enter the Topopolis. Now that is spinning and still gets some gravity from Earth, but as I mentioned earlier, cylinder habitats don't have to have flat end caps, they can curve to narrow, and a long skinny hab can have sections that get skinnier too, and thus spin slower in terms of their tangential velocity though at the cost of lower gravity at that spot. You can potentially play around with having many separate segments that spin at different speeds, especially if you've got ultra-low friction materials so that you can get a tiered ring setup that amounts to a long series of steps around the interior, but that might be more trouble than it's worth. Either way, be it smooth or rather more clunky, you are now inside that Topopolis, that ring's Earth's solar orbit. This is an example of what I sometimes refer to as a Terran ring incidentally, though they come in other forms. You can build the same Topopolis out around Venus or Mars, a motion ring. These can also be connected between each other by more Topopolis, stretching from the Terran ring to the motion ring like spokes, though this gets much easier if you adjust both planets to nicely circular orbits on the same orbital plane, which you probably can do if you're building stuff like this anyway. Connecting these spokes to the two rings, which do not orbit at the same speed, is also tricky but there are a few ways you can do that, including having mini topopolis or habitation rings between those two primary ones, so the connection speeds were slower and more gradual, potentially thousands, after all you've plenty of empty space between them. It seems pretty neat to be able to walk to Mars or Venus from Earth. Though considering these structures would have vastly more land area than all those planets combined, it's less a highway system than a habitat with a few smaller hubs of note attached to them. It would also take a human several thousand years to make that pilgrimage on foot, but there's presumably a lot along the way to see and you probably have radical life extension long before you build this sorts of stuff, so someone probably would give it a try. Done properly, you can lace together Dyson Swarms or more mundane solar systems via physical connections even if it is probably not terribly efficient, but it certainly is awesome conceptually. That is one unifying concept of coming and going between megastructures, since the methods vary so much by type of structure, available construction and transportation technologies, and motivation for travel. How you might come and go between them is hard to predict. All we know is that they are so enormous and variable and so awesome in their scope that folks will want to build them and to travel to see them. So today we were talking about megastructures and engineering and seeing many of the immense structures we could build under known science. If you're interested in learning more astronomical concepts or the math and physics behind them, I'd recommend Brilliant. The Universe is an immense and amazing place and knowing the math and science behind it only makes it seem more amazing, and Brilliant's thought-provoking, fun, and interactive courses make them a great choice for learning, whether you're a student, a parent trying to enhance your kid's education, a professional brushing up on cutting-edge topics, or someone who just wants to use this time to understand the world better, you should check out Brilliant. Try adding some learning structure to your day by setting a goal to improve yourself, and then work at that goal just a little bit every day. Brilliant makes that possible with interactive explorations and a mobile app that you can take with you wherever you are. If you are naturally curious, want to build your problem-solving skills, or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new. Brilliant's thought-provoking math, science, and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite-sized, understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with your interactive explorations, over time you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. If you'd like to learn more science, math, and computer science and want to do it at your own pace and from the comfort of your own home, 
Go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and try it out for free. So we were talking about navigating around megastructures today, but another common question is how such immense places would govern themselves, and what governments might be like in the future while trying to handle trillions of these colossal habitats in a single solar system, and in two weeks we'll explore that notion in Government Types of the Future. Before that though, we'll be looking at alien civilizations this weekend in our bonus three-part episode, Talkative Aliens and Laser SETI, which will be a collaboration with Parallax Nick and the Exoplanets channel. Then next Thursday we'll be back to the Fermi Paradox series to consider the possibility of galactic disasters. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or on our website, IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes, and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.